Would you like to learn about Kali Linux for ethical hacking and penetration testing? This could be your first or one of the first steps to get started learning about cybersecurity and this thing is more about the technical aspect of it. And I will teach it to you even if you have zero idea what Kali Linux even means. I recommend using Kali because it is lightweight, has a size of less than 2 GB, it can be installed on even basic computers and doesn't take that much of power or even resources. So it's lightweight basically in all those aspects. And remember what it is, is it's just another operating system, just like Windows. But the only difference is that Kali Linux already has got your most common hacking tools pre-installed. So you do not have to download and install them yourself. And that saves you a lot of time which you could have otherwise spent installing the hacking tools yourself. So that's really the main reason why you wanna use Kali Linux. You could have used something else but Kali has got the hacking tools already. So why would you do it manually then? Also it is 100% free so you do not need to pay anything ever to use it. And that's the third reason why you should use and learn Kali Linux as a part of your ethical hacking journey. So here's what you will learn in this whole tutorial. Three chapters. The first one will teach you how to install Kali Linux for practicing it yourself. Then the second one will give you an introduction to how to use Kali Linux graphically. And in the third one, we will learn many commands which you might need during ethical hacking as well. And of course, for general things like copy, paste, cut, etc. I know the syllabus looks short, but believe me, it's all you need to know. If you learn just this much, you will be 100% ready to use Kali Linux. As said, everything that you need to know about Kali Linux getting started and going strong with it is covered in this one short long tutorial. After watching this one single video, you'll be able to install and use Kali Linux very comfortably like all hackers do. And again, even if you don't know anything about Kali Linux at all, still I guarantee that if you watch this video till the end, you will know Kali Linux. Once you're done with learning about Kali Linux, you can open up my channel and further learn some more things like the Windows command line in one hour which so many ethical hackers forget about and then struggle with it. Apart from that, there are many more videos in my channel too which you can check and even more will be uploaded from time to time. Now, let's get started and learn Kali Linux. And you can really do it in less than one day if you're serious about it. The video is only two hours. So if you're ready, let's go. So before we get started with learning about Kali Linux and all kinds of things about it, I would say that it would be better if you could set up first of all a lab environment where you can install Kali Linux and basically then you will be able to play the video side by side and have the you know the lab environment on the other side of the screen and you can just do play pause do play pause do that's what you have to do and that would basically make it very very easy for you to practice this stuff while you're learning so i'm just gonna help you in this video building that same lab environment there are two things you will need for it so just go to google and search for vmware and basically you can land on their website which is vmware.com so this is the first tool we are gonna use and you can find resources here, click on that. If you go a bit down, you'll find product downloads, click on this. And then a new page will open from where you will be able to select which product from VMware company you want. So in this case, we are gonna use the thing called VMware Workstation Player. So basically, if I zoom a little bit, you'll be able to see the VMware Workstation Player. So don't go with the VMware Workstation Pro. Pro is basically the paid version. We are gonna use the free version here, which is VMware Workstation Player. And just click on download product. And now from here, you will just see VMware Workstation Player. We are selecting the latest version, 
which is 16.0 as of now, you can download whatever is the latest version when you're learning with this lecture. So just download the latest version from here and go to downloads and then you'll be able to click on the download now button. Now if you don't want to do all of this, I'll just give you also the direct link to reach on this page where you can directly simply click on this download now button and download it for your operating system. If you're using Windows or Linux, you can download the version accordingly. Since I'm using Windows, I'll be downloading the Windows version. Now the thing is, before making this lecture, I already downloaded and installed this thing, so VMware Workstation Player. Do not worry, it's a simple next, next, next installation. And once you're done with that, you can simply open up this thing called VMware Workstation Player from your start menu. So what you do is that you click on the link in the description, reach this page, go ahead and click on download now and install this tool. It's a simple next, next, next installation. As I said, do that and then you'll be able to see this tool installed. So when you open it, it looks something like this. What we're going to do with this is that we're going to install Kali Linux inside of the software. So it's very simple. You're not going to use any other system. You're going to use the system which you already have. And in that you will install a VMware player. And inside of this player software itself, you'll be able to install the Kali Linux and use it any way you want to. So that's a safe environment. Even if you mess up with the operating system, in that case, it will not be a problem because you can always delete the thing from the software and reinstall. So that becomes very, very easy. And now what we want next is actually the Kali Linux. For that, just open up your browser and again, go to a website in this case, which is Kali Linux ORG. Oh, sorry. I just said Kali Linux. It's actually Kali.org. So you just go in that and click get Kali. And here you will be able to find the download links for so many versions. But the one which you simply want is the installer. So installer 64 bit, just click on this download now button and forget about this weekly everything net installer. Just get the simple installer from here, download now, and you can just simply do that. So let me see where the download has started. You can see here's the download. I will not download it because I have already done that before. So let me just show you that folder where I have downloaded this same thing. And this is the thing which I downloaded. So here it is. And this is the thing which we want to install inside our system, inside the software that we just installed previously. So VMware player. So let me try to drag it inside of this. No, we can't do that. So what we'll do is that we'll simply click on this create a new virtual machine and installer disk image ISO and simply select the Kali Linux file that you just downloaded. Click on open, next, select Linux since Kali Linux is a Linux operating system. And here, if you can find Kali Linux, select that, but most of the times you will not see Kali Linux. So the thing which you have to do next is do Debian 10.x or basically whatever is the latest version of Debian you can see here just click that. You might ask why? Well, if you just search on Google, what is Kali Linux based on and hit enter, you will find that Kali Linux is based on Debian testing. So Debian is also a Linux operating system and Kali Linux has actually been built over this Debian. So doesn't matter if you select Kali or Debian, it's the exact same thing. So just like Debian. And in fact, there won't be a problem even if you select something like Ubuntu or one of these kernels. Like most of the times, it will still work. But since Kali is based on Debian, so it's the best choice to just select Debian latest version. Whatever you can see here, 64-bit. Click next. Give this virtual machine a name. So virtual machine again means that you're installing Kali Linux inside the software, not on the system itself. So you get my point, you're installing Kali Linux in the software. I'll just name it simply Kali Linux 
you can specify location here i will leave it default and then next all right so in my case it already exists so let me just choose a different name for it i'll say car linux 22.2 uh, so that's basically what i'm doing here and just click next now you will find two options here and you have to choose which option you would like to have so whether you would like to install this operating system kali linux as one file or in form of many separated files so just like single file here multiple files actually work when you have to move the things between computers so you want to install it in one system and then you know just go go and copy paste it into another system and do things like that in that case you will be using multiple but forget about all of these things use single for now because you're just starting to learn and this is the thing that always works the best for me so just select it single file and you can also specify or change the hard disk space now in this case 20 gb is absolutely fine and i just want to say that it's not gonna you know exclusively get or take that 20 gb of your hard drive it's basically the limit you're saying that the file cannot go over this you know 20 gb space so you're just limiting it but that does not mean that you will not be able to use it uh, that 20 gb from your main operating system or your main system click next here you can just review and change the settings for example customize hardware and you'll be able to change things like ram processor etc etc a good idea for the RAM is to give the Scala Linux, you know, half or less than half of what you have on your system. So in this case, I'm using Windows 10 and I know 11 is also out. So in my system, I have total 8 GB of RAM currently. So I'll be just giving it 2 GB of RAM. I could also give it 4 GB, but I'm not going to do that right now. If you have 16 GB of RAM, you can give it 4, but 2 is still fine. If you have 4 GB of RAM total in your whole system, then just give it 1 GB. And if you have less than 4 GB of RAM, then you can even go with options like 512 MB, but I would not recommend that. So just use a system which has at least 8 GB of RAM or 4 GB of RAM and select minimum 1 GB. But I will be using 2 GB right now because I have more RAM than that in my main system as well. Uh, click close and finish so now basically what you have done is that you have done all the configurations and now you can start installing the Kali Linux so till now we were just downloading it and configuring some settings and I can just click on this play virtual machine button to actually go ahead and start the installation for it and I just want to say that if you do not want to use VMware player software, you can also use other things like VirtualBox. So VirtualBox is another free option, VMware Workstation Pro, so not the player that we installed right now, the Pro version, that is a paid option. So you can also use that if you want to. But I always like to use VMware player because it is free and just does your work. So you can do that as well. All right, so it's making some sounds here. So let's go ahead and install it. So here, some basics about this software basically. What you have to do is that you have to first of all click on this VM and now your mouse cursor will get inside the system. If you want to get the mouse cursor back on your main system, you can use Control plus Alt keys on your keyboard and you can see this cursor is again back on my main system. So now I will go ahead and choose install. You have other options as well like graphical and other things but just go with installer. I think that is the most easiest way to do it or if not the easiest it doesn't make a difference whatever way you install it but I always like this basic installation so in that menu just click on install now it is asking you to select the language in this case i'll just leave it on english you can change it if you want to i'll go ahead and select my country you can select your country in this case i'm in india so i select that american english is the key map i'd like to use for the keyboard and now it will start the installation 
And actually, before that, it will also ask us a few more questions. So let's wait for that to happen. As you can see, it has done some work and it has again started to ask us some questions. So first of all, let me just do full screen here so that it's clear to see. And now it is basically asking us for a host name, which is already default to Kali. We will leave it there. Continue, which I did by pressing enter and then domain name. We don't need a domain. So let's just continue without setting anything. Full name for the new user. It is basically asking us to create a user account. And in this case, you can just use your name or whatever username you would like to have on the system when it gets installed. So because my name is Avinash, I'll just prefer to use that as my username. Continue again. And then it is asking us to select a username and continue. So the same thing and choose a password for the new user. Now you can just set a password for the new user. In this case, I'm setting the password Avinash. You can set up whatever you want. Again, put the same password and continue. So the way you continue is basically by pressing enter again and again. So now it is asking as the partitioning method. Now you don't need to understand anything about this. Basically just leave it that on guided use entire disk, which is already selected and hit enter. Again, we have only one option for the disk to partition, hit enter. And yes, we want all files in one partition. So recommended for new users, just go with the recommended and hit enter for finish the partition. Right changes to disk, yes. And now it's starting to actually install the base system and it should be finished pretty fast. All right, so after a few minutes, it again asked us some questions. Now it is asking us which form of Kali Linux we'd want to install. So basically it comes in different designs, but XFCE, which you see right here is the main environment so the default one and i'll just go with it for now and for this course hit enter and continue and then it will start to install more softwares okay so now it has asked us if we want to use the grub bootloader so this is what appears when you basically boot up this whole system so we're just gonna say yes and then it's asking us for the device which we want to use for the bootloader installation. So we'll just use, we only have one option, div SD. So we'll just select that and enter. And then I think this is almost gonna finish the installation and then it will restart the system. And then we should be able to use Kali Linux. All right, so as you can see now, it is saying that installation is complete. Let's just continue to boot. And now it should start our system for the first time. And just hit enter on this screen. As you can see, the login screen has come up. You can just type the username and password, which you previously said during the installation phase and click login. So if you again want to go and exit the full screen mode, you can just do that like this, which I just did. And you can again go in, go to the full screen mode. So you can see you don't have to do or change any resolution and it's already looking so good. So this is what Carlinx looks like. I'll teach you this stuff later on. But right after installing the system, I would recommend you to do a few things. Right click anywhere and open up terminal. And let me just zoom in a little bit. So I'll explain you what terminal and all of these things mean. But for now, just do what I'm saying. So just go ahead and run this command here. sudo nano etc app sources dot list which is a file hit enter 
So what we are doing is that we are modifying this file, okay? And this is a file which already is so good, but my recommendation is that no matter whatever is written here, you can easily delete all of this using the delete key on your keyboard and wait till everything of this has been deleted. And then you should go ahead and go to the description of this video and find a text file with some text I'm gonna show you right now. So here's the text which you will find in the description. Just copy it as it is and paste it here in this file. Now you have to save this file, which you can do using control O. Okay. So just do control O hit enter and control X to exit it. First task done again. Don't ask me what is nano and what all of these things mean right now. Just do what I'm saying because all of these things you will understand while you're doing basically the purpose of doing this first step, which I showed you right now was that if you don't do this step, some problems might come if you try to install some additional softwares. So this is a recommended thing to do. Now, another thing you should do first of all is try to upgrade to the latest Kali Linux version. So in case you're using an older version of it, you can basically upgrade to the latest version. And for that, you can use the command sudo apt upgrade. And you can even do the update to just update the list of Kali Linux. So these are the two things you can use to just completely upgrade your whole system and get to the latest version of Kali Linux. Now, because I just downloaded it, it already is updated and upgraded to the fullest extent. So I will just cancel it right now using control C on my keyboard. Once you're done with that, just run a few more commands in here sudo dash i and here now again don't do not ask me what this whole thing means i'll explain it to you later on just follow me right now so sudo dash i and now you are the root user any other user except root is not the most powerful so root is the most powerful user on the you know on the whole system of kali linux so just change the root files or the root user's password using the password command, hit enter and put the new password here. I'll say one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Done. And now you can just exit it and clear the screen and just close this whole operating system and start with the next lecture. You have set up this whole Car Linux thing. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to understand every single thing that we did. You're all set up and ready for that. And now let's start learning the Kali Linux finally. All right, so till now, I hope that you have already downloaded and installed Kali Linux in your virtual machine. If you haven't, you can watch the previous lectures to do so. Now, it doesn't really matter which option you took for the virtualization. You could have used VMware Player, Workstation, or something like VirtualBox as well. So I'm not trying to limit you in any way because this lecture is not actually about any of those virtualization softwares. It's rather about using the operating system, which is Kali Linux itself. Now, even though I say it's for Kali Linux, you have to understand that the commands and some of the things that I'm going to show you, in fact, most of the things that I'm going to show you will be applicable to other Linux operating systems as well. Okay. So first of all, what we are going to learn about is an operating system, Kali Linux, as I have already told you. And this is a picture of it. It's the 2021 version. However, I'm recording this lecture in 2022. And as you can see from the bottom right corner, you can see it's 6th March 2022. This lecture should be relevant many days after that and actually many years after that because the basics do not actually change very much. And there is also a recent, you know, new version of Kali Linux 2022.1 that you can use as well. You can use the latest version that's, you know, present at your time of watching this lecture. 
Okay, and I'll be very slow in this video and I'll not try to rush because I just want that every single beginner who knows nothing about any kind of Linux before should be extremely comfortable with using Kali Linux after this lecture. So this will be a complete guide and let's get started. So now this is one picture of how Kali Linux looks like. The background can be different but this is the basic look and it's similar to Windows as you can see. Actually, it's no way similar to Windows, but you can see that there's something like a taskbar on the top. You have uh, something like a start menu on the left side of the top. You have the power buttons on the right side and you have a trash, which is like a recycle bin and so many other things. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Now I'll just go and open up my virtualization software, which is VMware player. It's not mine, I mean, I have downloaded it and I'll be using this, but you can be using other things as well. And I hope you have already set up the Kali Linux machine, which I'll play right now. So now it's opening and to open Kali Linux, just press enter when it starts up. And here, by the way, one more thing that I think you guys might not know about is that when you click inside the Kali Linux, or any kind of virtual machine, your cursor will move inside the machine. So if you want to get back to your main system and take the cursor out, for that you can either just go ahead and hover your mouse to some other place out of the software, or you can just press Ctrl plus Alt on your keyboard and the mouse will come to your main operating system. Now here is what you call the login screen of Kali Linux. So after starting up, this is the first thing you get. Now just put your username and password. If you're using my image, I have already told you the password and the username in the last lectures. So you can watch that. Now, yes, maybe you're not watching this video in a course. Maybe it's your something like you're watching this on your independent YouTube video or something. But anyways, just put the password and the username that you have in Kali Linux and then you can press login. So I was talking about basically my image that I have given a specific image to the students of a particular course and that's why I just said that for the general. Okay, and sometimes actually, what you will notice is that it's, you know, the size is a bit like a problem. So in my case, it's not a problem, but sometimes the screen just looks very small. So you can just press on this full screen button to get into the full screen and it should probably be fixed. Okay, so I click on that and now you can see that we are on the system, Kali Linux, and if you want to get rid of this something like a, what should I say this? It's like a bar on the top of the software. Just click on this unpin button and it will be unpinned. And now it works like a real operating system. So I hope I'm going very slow and very clear till now. So here you have your desktop. You can move the icons and here you have some of the, you know, icon shortcuts and things. So just like you have in Windows and other operating systems. And from this point onwards, just focus on my cursor that you can see and I'll take you to everything that you need to know about Kali Linux. So let's start with the top right or actually top left which is the first icon that is for the start menu kind of thing in Kali Linux. It's called applications. You click on it and you get to see all of the applications categorized very nicely in these categories. And you can see an organized view of everything that you can see. All of these are basically softwares related to hacking and sometimes not related to hacking. Now let's just start with the very basic things. So for example, if you want to search something, just type it in here. So the first application I'd like to talk about is mouse pad. If you just type that, you will see you have a mouse pad here. This is similar to notepad in Windows. So this is a very simple application. You can just type the text here, save it. And I know you already are aware of those basic things because it works exactly like notepad. And you can just Cut this up and you can don't save it. So just click on it and it's not saved. 
again we go here and you can just change some things if you want on the settings you search for settings you get many of the things but let's go to settings manager so this is the main settings you can change settings related to appearance manager of window etc and you can just change things accordingly i'll not go to very specific settings in here because it's just perfect already now if you just right click on the desktop you will see that you have a few different things you can create a launcher so it's like a shortcut for an application and it's very simple to make you can just give it any name that you want you can put the command so it's basically like you know because you're just putting a terminal command here and you can use this launcher as a shortcut to use that and that command can be about a software or any specific function okay so i'll not make it right now and show you some other things you can also create a new url link here if you would like to just put the name of the launcher or the link and just give it the url you want to access and it'll create a shortcut for you for example i say google.com give it a name google and click create so it just makes the shortcut for me if i double click on it or just simply click on it or press enter on it then it will take me to google so and obviously i'm not i have not put the http before the name and that's the simple reason it's not working but if you just put that it will work so it's a very basic thing i hope you understand you can create a folder you can create document and that will just open the mouse pad for you if you'd like to and then you can open the terminals we'll talk about that in very depth right now you know, in a few minutes basically you can find something so it's like the search button and in the folder that you right click it will work for that you can find anything whenever you want in any folder you can arrange the desktop icons in a specific way you can open something in a new window you can go ahead and play with the desktop settings and you know for example set the wallpaper and things like that and icons and menus so all the basic things right here you have the applications again so you can specifically run a program or just you know click on any application you'd like to use and you can make use of that now i know i'm going very slow with it again but this is very important for someone who has no knowledge about the whole topic so I'll go slow like this. You can actually increase the speed of the lecture if you think it's extremely slow. Next, you have the other icon here on the top left. And this is basically for restoring the minimized window. So if you have opened something and you have just minimized it by this button, you can again get to see that if you would like to. So it'll just restore the minimized window for you. And I mean, all right, I just did a mistake here. Minimize is this. And I can just, you know, click on this and get this worked. Next step here, we have this folder kind of icon that just gives you some basic options and folders that you can go through. For example, desktop, download, etc. You can open up a terminal right now through which you can make the commands I mean you can type the commands and just run them very simply next up here you have a screen recorder kind of thing so you can just click on it and you can record a video by clicking on capture or you can go ahead and take a snapshot of your screen so screen cast is for video screenshot is for image that you can capture from your screen okay and you have the other things like workspaces so you can just go ahead and switch between workspaces. That means you can be opening some files on one workspace basically. And then when you have a lot of things and you don't want to mess the things up, you can move to another workspace by clicking about it on here. And then you can do some other work in here. And then when required, you can switch back to the first workspace. You can even right click on it and manage some of its settings. So here I have the basically the bar and I can go ahead and remove it if I want to. This has nothing right now except these icons on the right and left. These are the default ones. I have not done anything by myself. 
Here we have the time. You can just click on it and even see the date. You can see on this icon for the net connections and you can also connect to VPNs if you know what they are. You can click on this speaker kind of thing to manage the volume. You can click on this bell icon to just manage the notifications and you can click on this do not disturb. And you can even manage the power settings here if you just click on it and click on settings and you can manage what to do when some specific buttons are pressed and manage the brightness and some other things related to the basically the display and security and other things. Then you have the lock screen if you just click on it the lock screen will come and lock screen is basically where you type your username and password so I can just type that again and I'm in here again. The very right option on the top is log out so that will again take you to the login screen which I'll not want to do right now. Other things are basically this trash so this trash is like the recycle bin that you have in Windows operating systems. When you delete files, they go here and you can empty the trash to permanently delete them. Okay, so the next thing we'd like to talk about is the file system in Linux, that what all files you have and how are they arranged and similar things. And not just files, folders as well. So you have this home thing in the Kali Linux. When you double click on it, it opens your file manager stuff. So basically you can just manage all of your files graphically. Just like you have a my computer in Windows operating systems, it is that thing, but in Kali Linux with a different name. And it's very simple. So you can just go ahead and delete some certain files. You can right click on them, copy, cut, paste, and similar stuff. You can check the properties of the files to see their, you know, uh, their information and you can go ahead and do a lot of stuff here. What I want to talk about now is the file system. So how are all of these things actually arranged inside of the Kali Linux operating system? I'm talking about folders and files arrangement. So what does each folder do basically on the file system? Now I'll be starting with the bin. So bin is basically your basic executable programs. If you click on it, you'll get to see all of your programs basically that are there present in the system. So, you know, like copy, paste, and cut, move, all of these things, the basic things are in the bin. Then you have the boot. So all the files that are required to start the system are stored in the boot. Then you have dev, so dev is for basically devices. So it contains all the device information right here. You have a folder called etc, so etc or etc means configuration files. So it contains all kinds of configuration files for different softwares and even system configurations. You have the home directory. So home is something important you want to know about. When you click on it, you find that it contains the user folders. So whatever users are there in the system, their folders will be installed or I mean their folders will be created and kept in this home folder. So every user that you create in Linux except the root will be stored in here because the root user will have another directory of its own. So you can see root has its own folder which is not accessible as a normal user. That's why you see that cross there because we cannot access it as I'm in a user right now called Avinash, which is non-root. So root, if you don't know, root is basically the, you know, the super user who has the most powers and can control the whole system and basically the highest privileged user. So we were talking about the home and then you have libraries. So it's basically lib that stands for libraries, all the shared libraries are present in here and you have them for 32-bit and 64-bit and x32-bit for the other, I mean, just for the sake of categorization of them in easy way. And then you have a media. So I'm just not talking about the things that are 
temporary and are not present in any Linux system. I'm talking about the main ones. So we have the media in here. Media is for external devices. So whatever CD or DVD or pen drive you have, the removable media or devices basically are stored in here. Then you have the MNT, so it's the mounting point where when some, you know, when some devices is connected, for example, a pen drive, you can just like mount that in here and read the material and things like that. So it's related to the system, not very important for us as hackers. Then you have OPT. So OPT is basically the optional things. So some add-ons for softwares and stuff like that go in here. In my case, there is nothing in here, but there might be something in your case. Then you have PROC, which is for processes. So it contains all the process information that are going on the system or are present on the system with their ID. You have the root folder that I already talked about contains the information about the root user. So it's its folder specifically. You have a run. Now you don't need to know much about it. It's just like a system folder related to file system. Then you have sbin. So sbin, now see, earlier I talked about the bin folder, which contains the basic binaries, like the executable basic programs. But sbin is for system binaries. So system binaries are the system files that are not accessible most of the time by a normal user. So for example, some of these things, you will find a tool here called fdisk, which, which you cannot use directly. You need to be root for that, right? So the system related binaries, the softwares are present in here. Then you have SRV. SRV is for services information. So all the services that you have in here, now I have a TFTP, which is for the default thing that is already there in Kali Linux, but all the other services can be present here as well when you keep them. You have the SYS, which contains some other system files, not really important for us. TMP is for the temporary files, and this folder is basically accessible by all the users. So, you know, I mean, you don't need to be a root or something to access the files that are in the temporary. And normally these things are deleted when the, you know, system just starts up. So some of the things like boot information and stuff can be kept here and they automatically get deleted when the system is completely booted up. So then you have user. User is basically the folder that contains the data, the static data basically that doesn't changes which is accessible for all the users. So again, all the users can use these things and it contains bin and sbin, which is basically the same thing that you see in here. So you might say, well, what is that, you know, uh, this arrow kind of icon? It means shortcut. So bin is basically a shortcut for the bin folder, which is inside the user. So it's just an easy way to access it. And this cross is for the things that you cannot access as a normal user. Then finally, you have the var. So var contains logs and the other variable data, which the system can modify if it needs to. So it does not contain the static data like user. It contains file which can be changed by the system and some other softwares. And this is important thing that you will get to know when you learn more about ethical hacking. Okay, so then we have some image files and stuff like that, which are important to operate the system. So I hope you're now well equipped with the meaning of all these file systems. I've spent all this time, all these 20 minutes around in just setting up the foundation that helps you to now use the system very effectively. So now you can expect that you pretty much know everything that is obvious and that is for the basic uses of this operating system. So congratulations about that and I hope that everything apart from this is obvious except the terminal. So what exactly is terminal? Now terminal essentially is the tool in Kali Linux or actually any Linux operating system that lets you to execute commands. So you can control the command in or basically you can control a computer in two ways in a graphical way and in a command line manner. So 
Either you can just type commands through your keyboard and press enter and do things that way, or you can click on this stuff. And when I say Kalinux application, that means there are two kinds of applications. One that are graphical and others that are command line. So I have a difference here that I have made for you and I hope that this will help you to understand the difference. So here we can see the difference between CLI and GUI. CLI means command line interface. So it is for, you know, this is type of interface that is used in softwares in which you have to type commands and execute them in order to do the work. Okay, so this is a screenshot of a tool that is in the command line interface. Now here's the same tool, the in a graphical mode basically. So it was this, the same tool in, you know, command line manner. And this is the exact same tool in a graphical user mode. So I hope that you understand the difference. In graphical, you can click buttons and in command line, you just have one option. You just type commands through a keyboard and press enter and do things that way. So I hope that it's very clear right now. And let's get back to the Kalinux machine to understand the terminal and its basics. In Kali Linux, if you want to open up the terminal, the way is to right click and click on open terminal here. This is one way to open it up. The other way is to click on the desktop icon. Or you can even search about that from the, basically the search bar and you can either go ahead and click on this taskbar icon as well. So you have many ways to open it but it essentially opens up the same thing. Or actually, if you just go to a specific folder here and then right click and click on open terminal here, it will open the terminal, but in that place. So if I just open terminal random folder, you can see it is opening the terminal in that place. Okay. So that is one thing to know. And now we'll actually get started with the terminal. So I have the terminal here opened and first things you can just go ahead and use it in different tabs. You can type one thing here and one thing here and you can make more and more tabs and work with them. You have other things like preferences. You can go ahead and, uh, in, you know, increase its size if you would like to. I usually keep it to 14 PT, but you can increase it. So let's try something like 17 PT and apply. So now I think it looks much better and bigger. Now, if you want to zoom in this uh, thing, so if you want to zoom the terminal, just do control plus plus on your keyboard and keep doing it till you feel it's the right size. And similarly, you can even use the control minus minus again and again so that you can in or actually decrease the size basically. Okay, so here you have some of the other actions. You can clear the active terminal if you have anything going on there. So for example, if I type something and then I say clear active terminal, or I mean, if I type anything here and execute and then I want to clear the terminal, I can just go to actions and clear it. Edit view help contain some basic other information. So then some other basics about this terminal. What is this dollar sign? So this dollar sign basically represents that you are a non-root user. If you were root, it would have been a hash sign. So hash is, hash looks something like this. Okay. So if this was a hash, that means a root user. But because this is a dollar right now, that means it is a non-root user. So anyone except the root, basically. What does this kink sign here represent? It represents that you are at the home directory of your specific user. So, so you're not the, you know, so you're not basically at the home directory of any other user. You're at your home directory and that is represented by this king symbol here. Also, you should remember that the Linux is case sensitive. So that means if you have two folders in here named, for example, Avinash, where A is capital and Avinash, where A is 
just you know lowercase then these two will be different folders and you'll understand what that means later on so with these basics ready now let's get into actual commands that we want to type in here the very first command I'd like to talk about is pwd this type pwd and it means print working directory and that means where you are so what I'll do now is open the file manager side by side as well so here where I am right now is home Avinash and in the terminal as well when I have done pwd I am in home Avinash that is what it basically means and so essentially you can understand that pwd is just the address bar where you are in which folder you are right now okay if you want to move to another folder for example in home Avinash if you would like to move to some other folder you can just write its name after cd so cd means change directory if you do cd desktop that means you will get under cd now if you do pwd again you see that now you're in the home of Vinash slash desktop so we just change the directory now if you would like to move one step back then you can do cd dot dot so that will take you to home of Vinash again from home of Vinash slash desktop so now we are again in home of Vinash and you can even go much more back if you would like to. So I hope it's very clear. And this slash here just represents that you're in the root directory, not the root users directory, but the, you can say the most top directory on the whole Linux file system structure. So under this you know slash directory there are everything else it's basically the file system we clicked on now how do you see the files here on terminal that are present in the folder that you're in so i'm in the root directory right now as you can see with the slash when i do pwd if i want to see what are what all the folders or files are in this i can just use ls ls is list so i can just see a list of all the things that are in this slash directory Again, I can move to any of these things. For example, I move to home. And now I'm at home directory, which I can confirm by PWD. So I hope it's very clear till now. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the clear thing. So it's basically the clear command. When you type this, the terminal screen will be cleared. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is make a file here. So let's say... Now, because I'm in the home directory, I can just open the home. And here, we'll be, do, we'll be doing all kinds of work. So let's say this is the directory we want to work with. And we can also see that by this part. So in a short form, we are at home. Okay. Now, we are going to make a file. To make a file, you can use the touch command with the name of the file that you would like to create. For example, test.txt. Now, even if we do not specify this .txt, it will still be fine. But I always like to use the extension for the full name. So I will just say test.txt is the file I want to create and hit enter. Okay, so it just gives us an error which says cannot touch test.txt in this home folder because the permission is denied. So maybe only the root user has access to this. Let's do one thing. I'll go to the Avinash folder which is my current users folder and now i can just go ahead and work with this so same thing again touch test.txt now here comes the other thing that i'd like to talk about as a trick in terminal if you use the up arrow key on your keyboard it will basically show the previous command that you have typed and if you want to see and if you basically want to move further and see what command you will type next or i mean Basically, if you have gone up a bit and then you want to go down to the newest command, you can use the down arrow key. So this way I just reach to the test, touch test.txt. I do it. And now we are, because we are in the Avanash folder, you can see test.txt is created right now. So now we have a file. Now let's say we want to see what are its content. So to see the contents, you can use the cat test.txt so cat and the name of the file that you would like to see the contents of 
So as you can see it does not give us a result that is because we just created this new file test.txt which currently does not has any kinds of content. Now let's do one thing let's add some content here. So to add the content what we can do is that we can either graphically double click on it and change it with mouse pad or we can use some command line tools here itself. There are two main command line tools for editing the text which I'd like to talk about which are nano and vi. So we will talk about both of them one by one. First of all let's use nano which is the easy one. So you just say nano and test.txt which is the file you want to edit. So just hit enter and now you can just type anything that you want with your keyboard. So I type a few random things in here and then I can just use some basically keyboard shortcuts here to work with it to in order to save it. So if you want to save it just do control plus O on your keyboard. And then it is asking you to give a file name. So we are not going to change the file name we'll just hit enter and now it's saved. Let's say we want to exit it. So now we just do control X. So that thing that you're seeing on the bottom this up kind of symbol is basically for the control on your keyboard. So I have just done it. Now let's say I want to also exit it. So I do control plus X here to exit. Do I want to save the modified buffer? If I want to save this stuff? Yes. So yeah, now it has been saved and that is it. Now we can again do cat and see what are its content. So I can just go ahead and check the content of this file using cat now that we have written something on it. Let's say we want to change it. So again you can do nano and change it this way and save it again with control O, control X. Okay and next you can use the vi text editor simply. So vi instead of nano text.txt which is the file we want to edit. Now VI is a bit hard to use as compared. It is also easy but a bit hard when you compare it to the normal nano editor. So what you need to do first of all is press I on your keyboard to enter into the insert mode because without that you cannot add anything extra. You will need to basically press the I button on your keyboard in order to get to the insert mode which you can see that you're in the insert mode right now and just type and do all the things and this blue little symbol in here like kink or something I don't know its exact name it basically represents your like a uh, blank line so I mean this is not a line to be honest it is simply just nothing and then if you add that if you press enter then it becomes a blank line with no contents so it just represents when there is no data in there so you can just do the required modifications. Now if you want to save something in VI, you can first of all press ESC on your keyboard and then you're out of any mode. So you're out of the insert mode that you were previously in by pressing the I. Now you're out of that. Now you have to make a column. So just use the column on your keyboard and do WQ. WQ means write and quit. Write means you want to save the things and quit means quit the software. You can just do quit in case you don't want to save it and you can even just do write if you don't want to quit the software. So I'll do WQ to save and quit all together. And now again we can do cat test.txt and you can see the new contents that we typed in here are here. So this is very easy to use and let's do some other things in order to view this file. So let's say that we, you know, put a lot of contents to this file. So a lot of lines basically. I'll enter into the insert mode here. And what I'm doing is that I'm adding all of the lines that I want in here. And then I'll just go ahead and save it. So ESC and then I had to do w cube after that column so it is saved now. Now we can again cat the contents of this file and see what is there. 
So cat, what it does is that it prints the whole contents of the file. Now let's say you just want to see the first few lines of the, you know, of a very big file. Then what do you do? For that, you can use the head command. It is very similar to cat, but will only show you the first few lines. And it's about the 10 lines actually. I have not counted it, but it's around 10. So I say head and then just put the name of the file, which I would like to see the contents of. And you can see it does not shows me the full content right now. It just shows me the first around 10 lines. So first few lines head. Similarly, there is tail as well. So you do tail and then the name of the file you want to see the contents of. So I just press enter and I get to see the last few lines. So from the bottom to the probably the 10th line from the bottom. Okay. So that is what you do with the tail and some of these basic things. Now we did everything related to touch till now, right? So we made a file and edited the contents and certain things. Now let's say you want to make a folder instead of a file. How do you do that? So what I'm going to do now, since I am, for example, uh, I, I guess I'm in, okay, I'm in home of Nash still, which you can see, I can do ls. And here we made the test.txt earlier. Now, what I was saying is that we can also create a folder here instead of a file. To create a file, we use touch. To make a folder, we use a command which is called mkdir, which is for make directory. Directory means folder. So just say mkdir and the name of the folder you would like to create. I would say folder one. I do it because it is giving us no errors. That means it has made the file. Okay, so we do ls again and we can see that there is a new folder here, which is folder one, which was not there previously. We can move to this folder one and do many other things in it as well. So you see, we did some basic things till now, and I hope they are very clear to you. Now I will talk about three legendary things that everyone needs to know in Linux, which are, which are basically, how do you copy, paste, and cut, and you know, like remove files basically. So copy, cut, and how do you delete a file? These are the three things I would like to talk about right now. So graphically as well, let me get to the folder one. So here I am now on the terminal and in this graphical file manager, I'm both at the folder one. So they are at the same place. So let me just get out of this folder first by CD dot dot. And I am in home directory once again. So here I had something called test.txt, which we previously created. Let's do one thing. Let's copy this file test.txt from my home directory in to the folder one we just created. Let's do that. So for this, it is very easy. You just use a command called cp. cp is for copy. Then you put the name of the file which you would like to copy. You can give the full path or you, if you're on the same directory, then you can directly give the name and then where you want to copy this file. So folder one. Now we can give the full path to it actually. So for example, home Avinash folder one and just press enter and you will have it right now. So you see, it automatically copied that file here. And since there was no error, we could see it. If you wanted to see, or if you wanted to basically get the result here as well on the terminal that was it successful or not, things like that, then you could have used the dash V switch. So now I'm introducing you to the switch in commands. A command can actually serve a lot of purposes. So instead of directly typing the command, or I mean, along with directly typing the command, we can also specify some switches, some special, you can say properties to the command by this dash. So we put a dash here or hyphen, and then our, you know, specific, you can say uh, switch, which we would like to use. So in this case, it is V. V means verbose. Verbose means more detailed output. So when we do that, it actually shows us what it did. So it copied the test.txt to this location, which is folder one. Let's say you want to, you know, for example, move a folder. 
So first of all, here, let me see if I have a folder. Mm, let's say we want to place this music folder inside the folder one. So we can also copy a folder like this. Okay, so it's pretty much the same command. But what you're going to do essentially is you will have to use a switch which is dash R. So R is for recursive. Recursive is when you want to copy a folder. Because if I directly try to copy this folder in order like indirectly to the home of Nash folder one, what you will notice is that it will say dash are not specified because it is a directly. So we need to put something extra here, which is dash r for recursive. And when I do that, you will see it can, it automatically gets copied to the folder one. So folder one, okay. All right, all right. So by mistake, instead of folder, folder one, I just put folder here. So I'll have to put folder one. And now it just gets copied under the folder one. And by the way, you also got to know one thing by this accident that if you copy something to an unexisting directory, it will also create the directory for you. So because by mistake, I typed copy to the folder, folder directory automatically got created because it wasn't there already. So I hope it's very clear to you right now. We'll clear the screen and next talk about how do you move a file. So move or cut uh, is basically making a copy of the file to other location, but deleting the file from the first location. So you already know what that is, I hope. It's just basics of computer simply. So what I'll do now is, for example, I want to move this folder or I'll rename it something graphically first of all. Let's say I have this folder and I'd like to move it to folder one. How do I do that? For that, I'll have to use MV. MV means move. So I just do move. Now, since this is a directory, this is a folder, I'd like to, I'd again have to do the dash R. However, it's not necessary when you use MV. For some reason, it just directly gets copied as well. I mean, it directly gets moved as well. So you can either use dash R or not. Let's try without that. So MV123 into home avinash folder one. I do that and you can see inside the folder one, the one, two, three is moved and from the first directory, the home, it has been removed. So I hope it's very clear. You could, he, you could actually have used the dash R, but you don't need that necessarily here, okay? So we have learned about move and we have also learned about the copy. Now let's talk about how to remove a file. So let me go under folder one first of all. So right now I'm in home of Anash and I just go to the folder one by typing that in here. And now I'm in folder one, as you can see right here. Now let's say I want to delete this file. So to delete a file, test.txt, what I'll do is put rename, sorry, it's called rm and it means remove. So I just remove text.txt, press enter and it gets removed. Once it is removed, it does not get to the trash. Remember that when you delete something from terminal, it's gone forever. And even the recovery tools are not actually able to, for most of the cases, they are not able, able to recover the file. So be very careful with deleting files with terminal in Linux. Now let's say you want to delete a folder as well. So for example, one, two, three. Can you delete it normally? No. Same case, you will have to put dash R with RM so that it can delete a folder. And now it can delete a folder. So it has already deleted the folder. Let's delete music as well. And okay, so I can also actually at this point demonstrate that Linux is case sensitive. If I do music with the lowercase m, you will see there is no such file or directory. Now we have a music here. So why it is not basically showing that in here? Just because Linux is case sensitive as I previously taught you. 
So you will have to use M in a capital manner if it is capital in the actual file name. And now it is removed when I use a capital M. So I hope it's very clear till now. And you would have learned about copy, cut, paste, head, tail, cat, vi, nano, so many things, mkdir, ls, pwd, cd, so many things. And now I can just get into some more serious stuff right now. So for this, I can just delete or actually close this window for the file manager, which is graphical. And now I think we can directly work in this Avinash Edited Kali. So let's do that. So nextly, let's talk a bit more about the text files, okay, and their management. So we already talked about some basics, but we'll do something really quick in here because I want to talk about searching through a text file. So because I already deleted that test.txt, I'll have to again make one. So I created it and then I can just do nano text.txt, add some files in here, or I mean some data in here. So random things, and then I can just simply save it with control O and control X. So now this file is created. We earlier learned about the cat command to view the contents. You can see, we can see the contents right now. Let's say you want to see a specific line of the file. So what I will do now is actually tell you about another command, which is grep. So you can just basically search through a text file and search for a specific line there and show it as an output based on a particular criteria, which I'll show you right now. So to use grep, what you need to use is often called the piping technique. So there is this pipe symbol around your enter button on your keyboard, basically. So you can just use this pipe after the scat command and you can say grep and you can simply put the thing that you want to search for. So for example, you want to see the lines that start with D, okay, or that have the letter D in them. So then it will not show you the numbers. It will just show you the lines that have the D and it will even highlight where is D exactly. So you see, what you do is that you just take the output of this cat test.txt command and grep something from it that will basically give you the lines that contain what you have grabbed. Okay, so that is basic thing. I hope you have understood what it means. Let's do something on the file. What I'll do next is basically I'll also add a D here, which is in capital and leave the other D normally. So, and actually I'll delete these other Ds in here and then I will have to do control O control X. So again, if we do cat test.txt, now we have a capital D as well. Since I have previously taught to you that Linux is case sensitive, so if we again grab that thing, you will see that this time it will only show the D which is, you know, which is lowercase D. So it will not show you now the uppercase D. Now what do you do in this case? So what you can do basically is dash I with it. So you just specify a switch in grep and I basically means ignore the case. So when I search for D, either it is capital or small, it will still show it. So that is what this I means, ignore the case. Now you can see I am getting the capital D as well. So that is what it is for basically. And I hope you understood this. And you can actually do layers of grepping, but I'll not take you to that stuff right now because it is not important. What you have learned is more than enough. Now, how do I know that, you know, what switches are there in, for example, the grep command or any other command? For that, we can always specify a switch, which is dash dash help. So any command you would like to get the information about, and you can, just do a dash dash help after that. And that will show you a lot of information about the command you have typed. So it will tell you, for example, that you have a switch called dash I, which means ignore case and what it does and examples. Okay, so many other things are there 
which you can look at and this is not just specific to the grep command this is a very common thing which you can use for almost any command so for example i can see the help for cat you can see it also has this now similarly you have a man page so man page is another thing you can check so when you type man before any command and press enter you will get to see a text file which essentially is details of the you know the whole command that you have typed now it is very similar to dash dash help so we don't usually need it but you can check some details about it when whenever there is a situation you feel you do not find something in the help so then you can also check the man page similarly and it just works as a guide okay so i press q and it automatically quit the man page for me okay now we are almost done with this stuff very fast things i'll show you right now if you want to see what time what commands you have typed previously then you can just use a command called history so that just shows you all the commands that you have previously typed since the beginning of this lecture i used all of these commands and actually beyond or before this lecture as well so all the commands i just typed previously will be shown here with history command if i do id here so id is another command that will show you some details about the user and user groups okay so right now i am an user called avinash if you would like to see it directly that which exactly user are you then you can just type who am i so who am i means which user you are i am avinash user right now all right and id is just a bit more detailed it also shows you the user groups and groups basically are where more than one user can you know have the same permission so basically multiple users can belong to the same group you don't need to get into very depth of it right now since you're not an administrator of system you're an ethical hacker so you need you don't you need to know just what you need to know if you use another command called ps ps will show you all the processes that are going on right now however it doesn't works very nicely without the aux so aux gives you all the information rather than just some selected stuff so all the processes that are going on in this system from a to z it will just show you all of that right now okay so ps is for process aux is simply the switch that you want to use for it you can again do dash dash help and get to know what it is so it just tells you the user an id to each process some cpu memory stuff and start time when it started for how much time it is running the command which was used for it or if it was used so things like that again this is more like technical stuff so it will be used when we are actually hacking the systems but i'm just giving this thing to you right now for general knowledge let's say you do another command which is uname so uname just gives you the information on which operating system you're using but this is very general information so it's not even telling that it is kali linux it's just saying in general that is linux in fact for your general knowledge which i think you will appreciate is basically that linux is not an operating system by itself it is a kernel which is a core part of the system but is not the operating system itself so if in case you did not know about that and based on linux kernel there are a lot of systems and they are called linux operating systems now there is a switch with uname as well which is uname a which tells you more details so a means all information which also shows you that yeah it's not just linux it's kali linux this is specific version this stuff and this information can be helpful when you're actually hacking systems next thing you can do is say ifconfig so ifconfig just gives you information about the interfaces configurations i generally use it to check the ip addresses if you do not know what are ip addresses i have another video up on network essentials with respect to ethical hacking or penetration testing you can check that 
okay and you don't need to get worried about each of these tools a lot of people just tell me that man how do you know about so many things in linux and and how did you actually initially remember all of these things well when you work about all of with all of these things frequently you just automatically remember them and these are very easy things each tool has to be learned separately so there's no specific course or video that teaches that teaches you everything this lecture's goal is basically to teach you everything that you need to get started and use Linux comfortably so that you can then learn all the tools yourself if you want to. Linux has more than 3000 commands. You just need to practically know 30, 40 or 50 commands maximum in order to do your work comfortably. Next thing, again basic command, if you do uptime, you can see how, for how much time the system has been up. So you can see it has been up for quite a long time now. It's like one hour and 26 minutes. It is not in minutes actually. I mean, it is for the hour first of all, and then it is showing the minutes. So it does not gives you exact seconds information, but I don't think you need that accurate information as well. So next let's talk about how do you specifically search for a file with the terminal. So on the graphical interface you just right click and say find in this folder okay and you can find in other folders as well and you can just just find what you want to but when it comes to the terminal there are many ways and many commands that you can use for the same purpose let's also learn about the locate command in order to search files so if you want to search for a file in a linux system you can use the locate command and after this, you can just put the name of the thing that you would like to search for. What locate does is that it just searches the location of the file for you. Or it's not exactly searching a file, it's more like searching for a keyword. So everywhere this Metasploit was found, it just gives you that information. Another way to find something from a terminal is using find command. So you can just specify find here, slash. So slash just means where you want to find. So I'm saying that, okay, search in, in the whole Linux system. So don't leave any place at all. Then you specify switch, which is name and tell what is the name of the file that you would like to search for. For example, test.txt. And you can see it tells us that uh, specific thing here. So, you know, Okay, I'll just cut this right now. You can use Control C to cut or stop a task. So here, the file that I created, the home avinash test.txt that we created together in this lecture, and even the folder one test.txt, they are all present in here. So I hope you got that as well. Next thing I'd like to talk about is where is. Now let's say you want to search for a specific program name that for example where is python in this system or if there is python in the system. So you can use this command which is where is with the name of the keyword which you'd like to search for and this is more or mostly used for the programs. So for example I say where is python. It just tells you all the places where this python keyword was found or python program was found. Okay. So this is generally used not for folders or files, but for the specific programs. Another thing I'd like to talk about is how do you zip or unzip a file? So as I think all of you are aware of already that files can be in a zipped format. Sometimes we download files from the internet and they're zipped together. So zip is just a method of archiving. I have two files, let's say, and I just put them into one single file that becomes an archive and collection. So if you want to make zip of a file, how do you do that? It's very easy. So for example, now, first of all, I'm not even sure if there's a file here. Okay, there is. I do ls and it shows me test.txt, fine. So what I'll do now is zip this file. I say zip and then the name of the zip file, which I'd like to create here. So for example, news zip.zip so this is the name of the file which i would like to have finally as the output and then what will it contain so it will contain my file or what was the name of it 
uh, test.txt. I do it and you can see it says adding in this. If we do ls again, we see there is a zip file here which now contains the test.txt as the material inside it. Let's say I want to extract it. So we also have the extraction. Now actually, we can go to the location manually from the graphical user interface or this file manager and we can right click on it and open with whatever archive manager it has and then extract it to get the original material back. But let's say I want to do it from the terminal itself. So we have a very simple command unzip. So we just do unzip and the name of the zip file that you have which you would like to unzip. And now because I already had a file called test.txt in that location, would you like to replace that? Let's say yes. And it has been done. So now it will be unzipped and present on the location once again. Okay, so this is the file. And it just got overwritten so it made no difference, but I hope you understood how that works. Last few things I'd like to talk about is that how do you shut down a system? So if you'd like to shut down a system, what you can simply do is just put the shutdown command in here and press enter and within a minute it will just go ahead and shut down the system. Okay, so you can see it has scheduled the shutdown after a minute. Okay, but let's say you change your plan. You want to, you know, just stop it from having that schedule and to shut down basically. You can do dash C. So dash C basically means you want to cancel the shutdown and now it has been cancelled. You can also do shutdown now if you would like to. So if you want to just shut down right now, you can do that with this command as well, which I'll not do. If you would like to become root or actually use any program as root. So sometimes we just don't have a permission to use a program. For example, fdisk. So this is a program. And if I try to use it with a switch, dash L. Now you don't need to know what this is. I'm just giving an example. So I say, you can see, it is not able to use this program because I'm not root. I need to be root for using this. How do I use a program as root without being the user root or without logging in as root? I can use sudo. So sudo means super user do. Okay, so you're going to do the work as a root or super user. And then you will have to put the password for your own username. Press enter and it shows you the result. So fdisk is basically for the, you know, the external devices. You don't need to know about this at all. I just, I think I made the things a bit complex, but I hope you understood what I was trying to say. And if you would like to directly switch to the, you know, any other user, you can just do su and the name of the user. In this system, if we do not basically specify any other username, then, and if we just say su, that means it will ask you for the root password. So if we don't specify any specific username after su, then it will directly switch you to the root user. But you will have to obviously give a password for that. Let's say you don't have a password for the root user. What do you do then? So in that case, you can do sudo su. So you know, you can directly use your own password to switch to the root user. And you can see, I have directly switched to the root user with my own password, which I previously set. So it's not the root user's password. It's basically I used my own password to log in as root. Now I'm root. So you can see in the starting of this video, I just told you that there is a hash mark in a root user. That is what it is. And now a root user can do everything that is possible on the system. Like it can run the fdisk command and things like that very easily. And I can exit it because I don't need that right now. There is almost nothing left after this except the permissions and ownership which I'd like to talk about here as well. Since I have a file called test.txt in here, let's do one thing. We will go ahead and check an advanced listing for this. 
So I have actually two files in here, right? What I'll do now is use a switch with the ls command and this will be la. Okay, so ls-la for more detailed output. Now it tells me the permission, the owner of this file, the owner group or basically the group it belongs to. So user group basically and the like, what should I say, the file size and this is in KB, so not in the MB or GB. And you have the date at which this was created and the name of the file. So these things are there. And first of all, you have the permissions. So this is a very interesting thing. What exactly does this mean? Read, write, execute. Read, write, execute, things like that. So I'll show you what that means right now. First of all, understand that D means directory. So it is just giving you the type of the file that it is directory, it is a folder. If it is a dash, that means it is simply, uh, you know, it is a file, it is not a folder. If it is a I, now in some cases there is a f I, but you will not usually see it. But if you see, it means a shortcut. So not an actual file or folder, but a shortcut to another file. So I hope you know about that right now. And there is also an H switch that you can use with the ls-l that will show you this file size in a more better manner. In, the, in this case, it is not uh, showing that very well, but in some cases where files are in GB and MBs, it will show you the file size in a much better format. So next let's learn about how do you change the permissions and ownership inside of, you know, your, your Linux terminal. So you can see already that I have read, write, execute permissions and something like that here as well. Okay. I'll show you what that means in a second. Let me take you to the notes. What we are going to talk about right now is basically setting permissions. So if I just go to the machine for a minute once again, let's say I want to change the permissions for this test.txt and give it full permissions. This dash in some places, it just represents that there are no permissions except the dash at the first, which is for the file. But all the other dashes, they simply represent that there are no permissions, okay? So, okay, I will just show you how to change the permissions. Just do chmod, the name of the file, or actually it's in short, so in lowercase letters and then a number. A number like 777, which means full permissions to everyone. Okay, I need to... Put the number before the file and now it just shows us no error so that means it has changed the permissions i'll come to the details in a minute what that number actually means and what all other numbers are possible but i'm just showing you that so earlier if you see here there were some missing permissions or at some places there were no permissions or blank but here now everyone has all the permissions so you can see this so I have changed the permission using this, and this is just a number. And I'll show you what that number exactly means right now in the notes. So if that number is basically zero, that means no permission. And sometimes it is actually represented by a dash. So as I said here, it is represented as represented as a dash in the actual permission. But what we are talking about right now is this number. What all digits can be there and what is the meaning of each one of them. So if there is a zero in there, it means no permissions. One means execute, two means write. Since three is two plus one, it means write plus execute. Then four means read. Five, because it is four plus one, it is re it means read plus execute. Now you might say, well, 5 can be 2 plus 3 as well, so why not that here? So, I mean, obviously it's not 
making any sense because two means right, three means right plus execute. So if we use two plus three for the four uh, or basically five, it will just mean right plus right plus execute. So it will have two rights in there, which does not make any sense. So it is read plus execute. Six means four plus two, so read plus write from here. Seven means four plus three, so read plus write plus execute. Do you need to learn all of this? Probably not. You just need to know 777 and 000 because that will mean no permission to anyone. But was that? But what does that actually mean? Like you have one digit. We learned about a single digit right now, right? But here in the numbers, we specify three digits. So what does each digit re actually represent? So first digit is for the user, basically the owner, you can say. What permissions do the owner have? If there is a zero in the beginning or the first digit, it means there are no permissions to the user. The second is the user group. A user group can contain multiple users so that they all can share specific permissions. So for the system administrator and these kind of people, it just makes the work a bit easier. And that's why they add users, multiple users into a same group and it just makes the permission giving task a bit easy. So each user in a group will have the same permission. So what are the user group permissions exactly? They are in here on the second digit. The third digit represents the outside world. Outside world means anyone or basically it. So more specifically, it basically means that any user who is not in the user group of the owner that will come under the outside world. So that is basically what it is. The outside world is the third digit. So this way you can specify the, you know, the permissions for every kind of user, user group or outside world. Let me explain you what this means. Now, one more thing, read is represented by R. Write, write means modification. So it is represented by W. X means execute and execute is basically like running the file or running a program, you know, executing it basically. Write is modifying and reading is just reading. So 000, what it means really quick. So for the user, it means that you have no permission. Okay, so it means a dash. So it has like for the all three, for the user, it has no permission for the User group, it has no permission. For the outside world, it has no permission. 777 means all permissions because it means read, write, execute. So it means read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute to all three people or user group and outside world. 100, let's try with it. So 100 means you have just the okay so you have execute permissions for the user that's mean you do not have the read or write permissions you just have execute permission for the user and no permissions to the outside world and user group 755 what does that mean so 755 probably means read okay so wait it means read write execute permission for the user Five is read plus execute. So R and you do not have an write permission here. So it's execute and you have again a five. So that is basically it. So you can just make that easily from these three things I have shown you right here. And you can understand what the permissions actually mean. Just the thing you have to remember is in the images that I have in here. And I have written these. And not now, it's like my handwriting of like two, three years back, or maybe more than that when I was just starting up. So I used to write these things. I just took a photo and put that in here. Okay, 264. This will be your homework. Just tell me what that means in this specific manner. So in, you know, three digits for the user, three digits for the user group, and three digits for the outside world. What exactly does that mean? So this will help you understand the permission chart and I hope I'm not going very fast in this because I think it's quite easy stuff. It just is about the CH mode and the number 
and if you specify another number here 755 the things will again change so for example you change it 755 now you know that 7 means read write execute permissions to the user 5 means read uh, and I actually forgot what it was but I guess it was read and execute permissions to the user group and similarly read and execute permissions but not the write permissions to the outside world so anyone who is not in the user group okay and then I can again check it with the detailed ls and one advantage of using these switches so not with lh but with la or you can even specify h with that if you want to so one advantage of this is that you can even show the hidden files which might not be visible normally so the files that start with dot these are the hidden files that you can only see when you use the dash a switch with the ls command as well so i hope it makes the thing very clear and unintentionally i still use that i hope word which i'm trying to not speak because i think i have already done that a lot of times before similarly there is a ch own to change the ownership so earlier i told you that first user that you see in here is basically the owner second is about the group so you have the owner would you like to change the owner for a file let's say test.txt so just specify that file in here ch own and then now see in ch own you just can specify two things you can either change the user so the owner user and you can change the user group there's nothing like outside world for it so if you want to change the thing for it you can like let's say you just want to change the permission of this file to root or I mean the owner of this file test.txt to root just say ch own root test.txt you do that and now I mean obviously because I, I, I cannot do this permission because it's something related to the user and I'm a normal user so I cannot do that but I hope you got the idea that to any user I just go ahead and uh, change the permission of it or the owner of it basically with ch own so if I was the root user let me just do that for you if you want to see that really so I'll go to the same folder I'm already there I'll do ch own root test.txt and now I can do that now I'll do ls lah and h basically means human readable format just for the size you can see it sh it shows you the k here so it can show this stuff in mb gb kb and things like that okay so what i was trying to say is that when you use ch own root the permission of this file the owner of this file has been changed to root so you can see i have that as the owner when previously it was avinash all right and i can change the owner again let's say i want to also change the user group so the owner or the user group is still avanash i want to also change that for that i can just specify a column after the username here on the same command and i can say user group so for example that is going to be something like root as well so the first before the column it means the user that will be the owner and the after that column it means the user group that you would like to keep for the file once again we do ls and we can see the user group is also now root so these were all the pretty much the things that I'll, i wanted to talk about i know this has become a big video but this contains everything that a beginner needs to know to get started and use Kalinux very nicely there are also some tricks that you can possibly learn so for example you can use the clear command to clean the screen you can use the tab button to autofill what you're typing so let's say i type i already typed the command before now i can just type half of it and press tab and it will auto complete the thing for me so for example i i can just type cd and d i type d and then e and then i just type or press the tab button on my keyboard and it will automatically it should automatically actually complete the thing for me 
This worked in the earlier versions of Kalinux very well, but nowadays you can use the right arrow key on your keyboard to do the same thing as well. So you can see it just completes the thing automatically for me. I typed it half and then the tab button or the right arrow key on your keyboard completes it fully. If you freeze a terminal by using Ctrl S, you can do that unfreezing work by Ctrl Q. So Ctrl S basically means if you by mistake do this Ctrl S, that would mean that you're freezing the terminal. Freezing the terminal means that you cannot type more commands on it. So for some reason you might think, okay, you know, you just type that uh, or you just press the Ctrl plus S keys by mistake on your keyboard and then you just go ahead and unfreeze that by Ctrl Q and that will allow you to write the commands again. Otherwise when it is freezed you cannot write more commands. Ctrl A moves you to the beginning of the line while Ctrl A moves you to the end. Oh, Alright, so let's say I'm typing a clear command. If I do the Ctrl A here, I press Ctrl A on my keyboard and then it takes me automatically to the start of the command. So I did not did that with mouse or my keyboard directly. I just did Ctrl A and that took me to the beginning of the line. And that will even work with any text editor. If I do Ctrl E, that will take me to the end of this line. So E is basically for the end. That is why Ctrl E is used. You can run multiple commands in one single command. So for example, I want to run something like cd desktop and then I just specify a semicolon here and I say ls. So that will first show, that will first do the cd desktop and then it will also do ls. So I press enter and you will notice, alright so cd was not possible because we were on the folder one directory not on home but ls word. So you can see that we run two commands from just one command, alright? So in one line we can specify two different commands and do the work that way and it just makes the things much more easier sometimes. So semicolon is to add two commands and use them together. Press up arrow key, I have already taught about this to you to find previously typed commands and you can increase the terminal size by pressing Ctrl plus plus on your keyboard and sometimes Ctrl plus your mouse wheel can also be used. So I have already taught you these all things in the video earlier and I hope that you have understood everything in depth. Before ending this Linux topic, let's quickly cover some additional commands for different purposes. So I will not take much of your time now because I have already taken so much of it so we'll do it really quick. Let's say you want to create a new user in the system. How do you do that? To create a new user in the system, you can just use the command add user followed by the name of the user which you would want to create. For example, sky. Hit enter and it says that only root can add a user. So for that, we will just put sudo behind the same command and hit enter type the password for this username and then this user has been created this new user sky that we just wanted to create and now it's saying put a new password for this user so just make any password I'll say one two three enter one two three okay full name so you're just giving a name to this user you can just go ahead and hit enter for the default and I'll just hit enter for everything and yeah the information is correct. So that's how you do it. Now the new user has been created. Now after you have created the user, how do you switch to that user through the command line? You can use the command which is su. Su means switch user and then you just type the name of the user to which you would want to switch. So in this case sky enter password. So just put the password of that username. I had put 123 as the password so I just specify the same and now you can see I'm not Avinash anymore I'm sky user right now let's say you want to change the password of this user again for that you can use the password command and then hit enter and current password which which was 123 new password you can say anything 1234 let's say retype the password 
Okay, so it says you must choose a longer password. Let me choose something like Avinash is the best. And retype the same password. Alright, I did some mistake. Let's do that really quick again. So current password 123. Avinash is the best. Enter. Retype. Avinash is the best. So you can see it has updated the password successfully. So that's how you change the password of any user. Just go ahead and, you know, log in as that user and change its password. So that's how you do it. You can also change the password of the Avinash user or you can do a lot of other things. And if you want to get back to your previous user, you can again switch back to Avinash. So just put the password of that user now, which I think was Avinash, the same thing. And you can see I'm back again as Avinash. So that's how you do it. Now, let me clear this screen and try something else. Let's say you want to check that a system or a website, their server is alive or up or basically powered on right now or not. Or in other way, is it connected to the internet or to your network or not? Basically, can you connect to that anyway? So to check if a system is alive or not, you can just go ahead and ping it. And this is also the way you can get the IP of a domain name. So for example, ping google.com. That's how you do it. And then you can just go ahead and hit enter. So now it's trying to ping google.com. It showed us the IP of that system. And you can see it had given these replies. That means the system is alive. Google.com is connected on the internet and we can connect to it. And this is normally the first step of hacking. You just confirm if the systems are up or not, which you have as your targets. So that's just something to know. And then you can even instead of a you know, domain name like Google, you can even give the IP directly of any of your targets. But again, that thing you can learn while hacking itself. So you don't need to worry about that much right now. Let me now show you one of the other commands, which is echo. So I have put this command here, echo one, two, three into this text file. So let's say text or something like notes1.txt. So I'm just making this new file here. It is non non-existent right now, but it will create that file. What echo will do is that it will put this text. So we can put whatever here, not just numbers. We can put whatever we want here and then this greater than symbol and in which file we want to put this text into. Then hit enter and just do cat followed by the name of the file to see its contents. So you can see it's one, two, three. So basically we were able to echo that into this file. So that's how I do it. Now let's say you want to add a new line to it. For that, you can go ahead and just increase the number of the greater than symbol. Just do it two. So, you know, instead of one greater than symbol, you're gonna put two greater than symbols and that will basically add a new line to the same file because if we just put the greater than symbol and let's say we put some text here you will notice that it has overwritten the file so it has not added a new line or something it has literally overwritten the whole file so if we want to add a new line to this thing we can just put two greater than symbols instead of one and put some text here. So let's say second line and this and then I'll go ahead and cat the same thing again. So you see this one, two, three and then this has been added as second line. So always remember this is very important. This one greater than symbol is to go ahead and override the whole file and start and basically add your text from the beginning and this two greater than symbol means add that as a new line. So I can just clear the screen and show you something else now. How do you install tools? Well, it's pretty easy and there are many ways you can do it. But first of all, the recommended way is that you can go ahead and apt install followed by the name of the tool you would like to install. So let's say something like 
cherry tree so this is basically the name of the tool and this is a popular tool so it will be there in the apt so you basically say apt apt is the tool and then install so you want to install it and then the name of the tool hit enter and of course you will need the sudo privileges for it so you can see it will if the tool is not already present on your system it will go ahead and install that okay so that's pretty easy now let's say you want to remove a tool so for that you can use a very similar command which is basically apt remove now you can use this command apt remove as it is but i would recommend putting a special switch here which is purge so basically what happens is that if you just use the apt remove followed by the name of the tool you would like to remove or uninstall what happens is that sometimes some specially modified configuration files or stuff is left so it's a good idea to just put this purge switch in here and that will go ahead and remove every single thing so this is a more detailed kind of removing of the tool so i just recommend it you know i just recommend you to use this as well hit enter and now it's asking that if we really want to uninstall it yes and you can see this is how you un uninstall a tool using the command line itself you can even do that graphically but this is how you would do through the command line and you can see it has been removed and you can again install it through the same command now this thing might be good in case you know when you're having a tool which is popular enough that it will be in the database of the apt command however sometimes you put a name of a tool which apt cannot recognize or find so in that case what you should do first of all is try to update apt update that means apt will basically update its list of the tools that it knows so it will just update that you can hit enter and it will do that if you just put the sudo before it and then you can go ahead and try to use the same command to install it so that's a good idea in case you know you're using an old version of Kali Linux where it is not the latest version of apt so that is how you do it and then you can if you want to upgrade to a newer version of Kali Linux directly through the command line you can use the apt upgrade command so if you just hit enter basically what will happen is that your Kali Linux version will be changed or upgraded to the very latest version but I'm not gonna do that right now and I'll just clear the screen because I just want to tell you about that and didn't really want to update anything for now but you can do that always now this was how you install some tools in one way so apt is one good tool to do that but you know do not think that this is the only way to do it you can also manually download the tools from the internet and install them according to the guides which you might find on the internet as well and when you're manually installing something it's very similar to you know how you do it in windows sometimes so you might just find the whole graphical installer click next 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 button that kind of installers also come for linux but many a times what will happen is that you will get a command line you know situation where you just have to do it using command line so in that case if you have manually downloaded something a setup file basically for your linux system for any software it will depend how you install it on the extension so let's say that it was a deb file deb means a debian extension file so in that case you might want to you know use something like dpkg i dpkg is basically a package manager software you can use it with the dash i switch to install something so if you have downloaded something called setup.deb you can use it but again it really depends on what extension it is maybe it is not deb it is something else then you can just google it always and find out how to install the softwares of that particular extension in Kali Linux or in Linux general because what happens is that in Linux and Kali Linux and all these Linux operating systems the commands are almost the same so nothing really much changes except the locks and sometimes the kernel changes 
but the commands for the most part and at least the basic commands and the working remains the same. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the wget command. We all know that if you want to download something from the internet, then we just go to our browser and click on the download button on any website to download something, right? But how do you do that from the command line? It's very easy. You can use the tool called wget, which means web get. So anything from the websites you want to get or download, you can use the wget command followed by the exact URL of the thing which you would like to download. So I don't know what I'm gonna download right now. So let me just go to the web browser and try to find something which I would like to download. And we'll just wait for the Mozilla Firefox to load here. And let me just go to something like, okay, so I don't know what I want to download right now, but let's say we are going to the internet and download something like XAMPP. So XAMPP is a tool. And if we want to download it, we can just go to the internet and click on download. So basically what we're trying to do right now is get the URL of the file which we would want to download and put that URL onto this wget command and then it will automatically download that for us. So the internet is pretty slow today because I'm downloading something else as well. So you can see XAMPP for Linux. So just go ahead, right click on it and of this download button, you can just go ahead and copy the link location and put that in front of wget. Enter and you can see it's trying to download that same thing. But I will do control C to cancel this. I don't want to download it, but you get the idea, right? So just put whatever you want to download, the URL of what you want to download in front of the wget command and that will download it for you. An alternative command will be curl. So with curl, you can do many, many things, but this is one of the simplest features or uses that people use it for. So what you will be doing is that you will say curl and it's a very similar command. But in this case, you will also have to specify the output file. So the name of the file, which, you know, in whose name the file that you download will be stored. So something like, let's say, test dot or, you know, test one, 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 something random. And then I just put the URL of the file, which I want to download. So same thing. So in this case, instead of, you know, directly putting the URL, we are also specifying this dash O for the output file. So this file will be downloaded, but will be stored with this name on the system. Hit enter and you can see it's trying to download this file. Again, I'll go ahead and cancel it. So I hope you got that. Now I'll show you something very, very interesting really quick. But before that, I'll go ahead and cut this whole browser screen. So basically, let's say you have a very big command. Okay, in this case, I'll take a small example. Let's say there is ls. But if this was a very big command and you don't want to type it again and again, then you can basically make a short form of this command which when you will run from the command line, it will basically run this whole, you know, command for you. Let me just write the syntax and then I'll explain it to you. So what I have done is that I have said alias something is equal to this. What I'm doing is that I'm creating something called an alias. It's usually the, you know, a text or basically a new command that you're creating yourself, which is made out of other commands. So you're just saying that make an alias, make a command called something, which when we will type this something, it will just show the output of this command. So you can put a bigger command in this place and make the short form of that command here if you want to. So now I have hit enter and that means that when I will run something, the output of this ls command will come. So it will just list all of the things. You see, something is not another command. You know, it was not present by default. I created it right now in form of an alias. I do something 
and you see it runs the ls command. If you want to remove this alias and just keep it simple again, then you can go ahead and do un alias something. I don't know the pronunciation. I think it's called alias and that's why I'm pronouncing it like that. So if we do un alias something, it will again make the something command useless. So you see, I created a whole command for myself out of the other command. So let's say this is a very big command and you don't want to type it again and again. You can just create an alias, which is a short form command, which you can use for this same uh, bigger command. So it's basically making your own command in a way. So I hope you get that. And now we can get into the last thing which I'd like to show you today, which is starting and stopping services. If you want to start a service, then you can just say service followed by the name of the service and start. So you might say, well, what is a service? Service is basically, you know, I mean, there can be multiple services and they all can mean different things, but this is the name of a sample service, a demo or example service. Apache 2, which is a web ser server service, basically, and you can do start. Let me show you what that means on the browser again. Now, I'll open a new tab and do ifconfig to get my IP address. This is my machine's IP address. And I'll just go ahead and open the Firefox and you can see when I try to visit my own IP nothing is coming here but Apache 2 is a service so there are many services this is one of the services with this one specific meaning when we start this Apache service what will happen is that we'll be able to visit this local you know website so it's basically setting up our local web server I have to put the, my password here and now if we go ahead and try to reload this page, the thing should come again. All right, so it's not coming because it's HTTPS here. Let's do with HTTP and I see we have got this page. Earlier, we could not get this page. So this is basically running a service. Again, different services will have different meanings and you will get to learn about a lot of such services when, you know, the time will come when you will be learning hacking itself. So right now I'm just giving you a pace and you don't need to worry much about that. For the proof of concept, if we just stop the service, which is very, very easy. So let me just show you how to stop the service. Just do service followed by the name of the service. You want to stop and stop. Again, authenticate it. All right, so I think I put the wrong password here. And you see the service has been stopped. So now if we try to reload the same page, you see it again does not come. So that is how it, you know, this whole thing works. Now I'll again start it and show you something. So this specific Apache 2 service, it set up, as you can see, a local web server for us on our own IP address. It will make this page. So the main use of this thing actually is that if we want to host something on our server, and then maybe on a victim machine, we will download something from here. Then in that case, this can be very helpful. So the files of this web server are usually in, uh, stored in var www.html. So you can see here, there are not a lot of files here. And this is basically the same files of this website, this local thing we have just enabled. Now we go ahead and put a new text file here. Let's say echo and all right. So let's do sudo here. Okay. So permission denied. It's not giving the whole thing. Let me do that with one. It's not working. So I'll do one thing really quick. I'll just directly switch to root. 
and the root password i think i forgot it or it was password so now i can just make a file here basically so basically what i'm doing is that i'm echoing okay i'm echoing a file or a text one two three into a new file which i'll call let's say notes.txt i hit enter and now this file has been created here so this is the same folder where this web server is sitting now that we have created this new notes.txt file we can go ahead and try to view that here itself so this is just for the example you can see one two three the same text is coming here so basically on the victim system you can just w get this url or these kind of things to download files from your system like an exploit or something but again those things you can learn while hacking itself so that was the service now what happens by default is that a lot of times you know when you run such services they will only be enabled for this time you have opened the system if you turn on the system and turn on it again or restart it this service will again get stopped automatically. So if you want to make it permanent, then you can just do system CTL enable and the name of the service which you would like to permanently enable. So in this case, Apache 2. And put your password. And you can see it will just enable that permanently for you. But in this case, it's again showing us an error. So maybe we need to do sudo. And now you can see it has done that. So now every time we open the system, we don't have to manually open or, you know, just start this Apache 2 service. It will automatically be enabled on the startup. So that's just a good thing to do. And that's how you basically do it. You can even try to disable it. I've never tried it. Let's do disable. And you can see it has also removed. So it's very similar, enable and disable if you want to remove this from the permanently enabled list. So that's what it means. So these were all the things I wanted to teach in this lecture. Of course, the, you know, there are other services as well. So apart from the Apache 2, there are things like post gray SQL and stuff like that, which you might want to start for different purposes. But again, all of these services and things you will be learning while you learn hacking itself. There's no point in teaching all of these things right now. I just showed Apache 2 to you for the proof of concept and just to, you know, show you one specific service. But again, there are lots of services, lots of meanings, lots of stuff, and you can learn them while you're learning hacking, as I've probably said 10 times by now. So that is it for this whole chapter, and I hope you enjoyed it a lot. Thank you for learning with this long format course or tutorial, whatever you might want to call it. And I'm really excited about finishing this course and this whole tutorial basically to learn and teach something more. So you have learned Kali Linux in this lecture and hopefully understood everything that I taught you. If you got any questions, please put that in the comments below and I'll try to give you a thoughtful answer. And if you want to learn more, you can open up my channel, Compro Avi, and you can basically go ahead and learn about other things. I have posted many more videos about many other things, and I'm sure that these are going to help you a lot. So I just wish you best of luck with your whole journey, and let's actually get together in the journey, and you can suggest me what you want to learn next and I can make some more lectures about that too. So in this lecture you learn Kali Linux, maybe why not go ahead and learn Windows command line now. I have another video for that. So that is basically what I wanted to say for this whole lecture. I'll not stretch it anymore. So just thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video on my channel.